Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the eighth and last panel in our Stem the Vote Summer of Science Policy Series. My name is Tiara, and I'm a member of the Programming Committee on March for Science um, New York City. So a quick intro for those joining us for the first time. March for Science NYC is a nonpartisan group formed by the scientific community, and we stand for three core principles. The first being open access to scientific information, the second being science for the common good and preservation of an informed democracy, and third, protection of human and, and environmental rights. This series of information panels aims to put data and information in the hand of voters and the general public and is supported by Science Rising and the Union of Concerned Scientists. We encourage everyone to register to vote, visit sciencerising.org, and take the Science Rising Challenge. Today we'll discuss education policy, a brief history of our education system, significant policies, and how we can make schools more equitable. We're joined by Jonathan Collins, an assistant professor of education at Brown University. Jonathan's research focuses on racial and ethnic minority political behavior, democratic governance, local and urban politics, and public policy with an emphasis in education policy. Our second panelist, Ronnie Almonte, is a science teacher in Brooklyn and also a delegate of the United Federation of Teachers and sits on the steering committee of the movement of rank and file educators, the social justice caucus within the UFT. A quick housekeeping note, we're turning off the chat. So if you have questions for the panelists, please put them in the Q&A function of Zoom. And with that, I'll hand it off to Alyssa to moderate. Thanks, Tiara. Um, great introduction. So thank you all for joining and being a part of our uh, policy panel on education today. Um, so we can go ahead and jump right into it. And first, um, Dr. Collins is going to give us a background on uh, the history of education policy uh, in the US. And then we'll get into some more uh, Q&A between both panelists. Sure. Uh, thank you, Alyssa. Thank you, Tiara. And really thank you to the entire sort of March for Science uh, organizational structure and leadership. You all have been great. Um, and it's an honor to be a part of this conversation. Um, and it's an, it is an extreme honor to be here with my fellow panelists, Ra Ronnie Almonte. Um, I'm looking forward to hear, hearing what you have to say as well. But I'll get it kicked off with um, just a quick background on education policy, because you know the history of it is something that I always find particularly interesting. When we think about you know uh, what public schooling is in the United States, it really is the story of elites looking to uh, exercise control, um, so, uh, social, political, and you know sort of moral control. Public schools were never meant to be public. You know, uh, schooling in America started as a um, as really basically extremely localized institutions, usually religiously affiliated. And it was an opportunity to essentially disseminate certain lessons on sort of moral and ethical behavior and maybe um, dispense, dispense certain messages around um, science and discovery. Although science and discovery was far uh, in the background relative to the former. It really was about um, getting people to engage in certain types of like social behaviors. As education expanded heading into the sort of early 19th century, we saw the Horace Mann project and the expansion of schools into this idea of it being sort of the quote unquote great equalizer. But even then there were limitations in terms of the expectations and then the, the idea that morality and moral teachings and the understanding of like how human beings are supposed to behave in society was still at the forefront. The only thing that began to compete with the moral impetus was the idea that education should be something that feeds directly into our labor supply. This is something that became, uh, it sort of reached its apex arguably in the, the mid 20th century, where you know during this moment where we're heading into World War II, elites are looking around and they're saying, hey, we need to make sure that we're producing sort of literate and competent and intellectually competent soldiers who can actually like go into the battlefield and are we producing competent folks who can go into 
uh, manufacturing industries and be able to produce supplies that again, su uh, feed into our ability to be successful when it comes to war. It was only until post-war when we really started to ask critical questions about what education is supposed to be. You know, Brown v. Board, the Brown v. Board, Brown v. Board of Education ruling, I'm sorry, was a critical moment in the history of American public education because this is when we had to fundamentally address the fact that schools were inherently unequal, that we were actually creating these institutions that were not giving a fair opportunity to kids based specifically on the color of their skin and really the wealth, the background, their economic background and, and gender as well. You know, we had a school system where, uh, where young girls were being funneled into more domesticated um, educational pathways. All of these conversations started happening around uh, sort of post-war, mid 20th century. And then from there, we've been really trying to figure it out. Brown v. Board set the precedent for the early second, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. This became the federal government's first sort of long-term commitment to having a role in investing in public education. This also created opportunities for state governments to come in and assert their role and their dominance over the role of education. This was a two-sided two coin. On the one hand, you know, state education agencies are better equipped to administer education, but on the other hand, state, states have a particular incentive. States compete with one another for labor uh, and access to um, human capital. So when we have uh, the state governments coming in and deciding to take on education as a primary issue, what they're doing is we're trying to figure out how we can make a, the kind of education system that would lure and attract the kinds of people who we want to live in our state. The kinds of people who we want to live in our states aren't always the kind of people who are on the wrong side of the inequity disparity. Typically, it's the folks who aren't on the right side of the inequity disparity. And what we have and what we see today is pretty much the continuance of the things that we've been seeing pretty much since that post-war period. We have great, we have uh, schools that are greatly unequal. You know, we have huge inequity problems. You know, the probability of a black child getting a quality education in America relative to the probability of a white child is significantly lower. Um, schools are more overcrowded. Um, access to quality instruction is harder to come by. Uh, we know the disparities, we can count them. The, 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 the amount of funding that's aimed toward those schools is significantly lower, even though we've gone through a series of state reforms to try to even that out. Even though we have a federal government that provides supplemental funding that's been doing so for well over half a century now into schools based off of, you know, the income composition of the school as well as um, student performance, we still see major disparities in terms of resource resources that are allocated. But it all goes, goes back to this kind of central idea that, you know, education in America was always dis, always constructed as a school, as, a, as an institution to assert control, you know, to concert, to assert dominance, to essentially decide, you know, who our winners and losers are um, in this society. And we continue to see that today. We're trying to fight for um, particular kinds of reforms that can rebuff that. But it's very, it's very difficult to stop uh, such a large uh, machine that's been in motion for such a very long time. Great, great. Thanks for that intro. Um, it's storming really bad here, so I'm sorry if there's some background noise <laughs> from the window, um, but hopefully you can still hear me. Um, so yeah, so I think you were ending, um, or really bringing across the point that the education system wasn't really built to educate everybody equally. And that's still a problem that we're definitely seeing today. Um, so Ronnie, you're a school teacher in New York City. Um, could you speak a little bit on how you see this in your schools and in your neighborhoods um, and some of the activism that you're doing to help combat it? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think in New York City public schools right now, we have um, we have a couple of problems. Um, one of them is that this school system, just within New York itself, within the city, is extremely segregated. It's the most segregated school system in the country, and it's even more segregated than it was in the past. Um, so you kind of have to think about how much of an impact did Brown v. Board of Ed that that decision to actually make when it, uh, when it applies to, to the cities of the, of the North. And there's a history there that I think explains um, why especially Northern cities are... Um, 
you know, are so segregated, but, you know, maybe we can have that conversation a little bit later. Um, so what I see is schools that are um, either very black and brown or very white. And, you know, I've taught in a couple of different schools already. And I taught in one school um, where, uh, you know, there wasn't a mirror in the bathroom, where there were bed bugs and roaches crawling um, on the walls, on the desks, during the day, during a lesson, during a lecture. Um, and then I've taught in a school uh, with a newly built building with um, uh, water fountains with filters in them, um, you know, no infestation. Um, but guess who all the students were, or most of the students, what they looked like? You know, they were white. And uh, the, their, their PTA um, had such a huge fundraising arm um, that I was able to get any supplies that I really wanted in a public school in New York City. But the catch was that it was a mostly white school. So, um, you know, you, you definitely see this, uh, this division, really the segregation in the school system here in New York City. And as a, as a teacher, you can't, you, you just can't, you can't miss it. Um, so some of the activism that I've seen, um, you know, has really, um, you know, been about, you know, pushing for like actual funding of the school system. Um, but even before Corona, uh, before this pandemic, uh, the schools in at least New York state across the state were owed billions of dollars from Albany. Um, in New York City in particular, um, Bloomberg, the former mayor, uh, had instituted this uh, formula for funding uh, sc individual schools in the city, um, the fair student uh, formula. And um, even by the standards of the city, um, most schools have actually not been, um, been fully funded. Um, so we have a tremendous problem here, an economic one, uh, and a racial one, but they're actually interconnected. Um, one kind of reinforces uh, the other. Um, and so a lot of, you know, the activism right now is, I think, about pushing for both integration of the school system um, and for um, actually fully funding schools, um, the opposite of what's happening now, actually, when school budgets are being cut uh, uh, more after already being uh, uh, starved of funding after already uh, their budgets being cut from the last time uh, there was a re there was a recession um, 12 years ago and those fun and those funding levels never have been rest having been restored um, so you know there's a lot to fight for uh, we need to fight for a lot of money and that money has to come from somewhere so a lot of the fight is also about um, taxing the rich which I, I suppose we can talk more about yeah, thank you. Um, so something you brought up was that um, at the more well-funded, more white schools, um, having PTA parents on the PTA who could do a lot of fundraising for the school, and I guess the parents had maybe a lot of say in how the school was spending that money. Um, and I know Jonathan has done a lot of work on bringing uh, more democracy and more democratic principles to schools. Um, I've also heard that this is something that can um, really depend a lot on what district you're in and where and who the student body is. Is it more white or is it more students of color? So Jonathan, could you speak on that um, and why, why some, stu some districts have schools where parents and PTA have some more control and others lack that control and lack that uh, engagement with the school? No, oh, you're on mute. Right. So sorry about that. There's um, kind of two pieces to that puzzle here. And, you know, the one is the kind of like the institutional design piece. And then the, the, the other is the capacity piece. And the two are very much in interconnected. So from a capacity speak standpoint, this is what having, you know, an, an entire educational foundation attached to your school or your school district does. It gives you the capacity to provide additional funding into your schools. And what does it mean when you have a, a foundation or some sort of supplemental source of income that you can funnel into your district or your school? It means you can pay your teachers more money and or you can hire more personnel that can assist with instruction that makes it significantly easier for a teacher to do his or her job. So without that, you get a teacher that's extremely, extremely overburdened. So it becomes 
like I said, a capacity problem. Now, structurally, why, how did we land in this position? We landed here because as we've had, um, you know, sort of federal and state level reforms that have tried to create more equity in terms of the resource allocation that we see in our schools, in our districts, we, we have, you know, parents and, um, you know, these political actors who find these different ways, who find these quote unquote blind spots um, that they can sort of utilize in order to maintain these advantages. So one of the paper, first papers I, I got published was this paper called, you know, Buying Schools with Social Capital. And what I found was that I'm looking at, you know, differences in education spending in the state of California across counties and then also across districts. And I'm finding that over time, the overall differences in spending are actually declining. And the interesting thing though here was that like, to the extent that the, the differences remained across districts, it wasn't, it wasn't the property values or any kind of economic factor that was the largest, um, which, is, which was the biggest sort of um, explanatory variable when it came to these remaining differences. It was the prevalence of what I identified as social capital institutions or what Bob Putnam at, at Harvard called social capital institutions. And these are just like your civic organizations, membership-based organizations places, whether it's like a bowling league or whether it's, you know, um, a, a local YMCA, whatever sort of like membership based or kind of like social gathering centered organization. These are institutions that parents are actively using in order to, you know, find different ways to allocate different additional funds into schools. This is where fundraisers are happening for educational foundations so that we can put more money into the district so we can ensure that we hire you know, the teachers who would be lured in by a higher salary and or we can provide the additional personnel that it would take in order to keep those teachers from being overburdened. So it's one thing to pay attention to like the funding formulas and the way in which the states are structuring um, the way that schools, the way that funding is actually being funneled into schools. The other thing is to look for these quote unquote blind spots that a lot of non-formal uh, actors are using as ways to preserve advantages that we see in some of these districts that tend to be majority white uh, and, and majority higher income. Okay, yeah. Um, and while we're talking about funding, um, either one of you can uh, mention, uh, talk to this. Um, so you're talking about the difference between social capital and things like property tax and stuff that uh, the funding formulas use, but there's still a lot of inequality when it comes to the more formal ways, I guess, that the schools are funded with these property taxes um, being one of the main sources. So could either one of you um, explain kind of the basics, I guess, of some of those funding formulas and then also why is it that um, the system is set up that way, that we only take funding from local sources to those schools instead of having a more equally distributed amount of funding across districts and across schools? I can, I can try to speak at least to the New York City um, experience. Um, I, think, I think people uh, don't understand really how much Bloomberg, Mayor Bloomberg made an impact on uh, the entire school system here in New York City, but in funding um, in particular. Um, you know, when he moved, uh, when he reformed the school system and its funding, um, he basically tied uh, each individual school's funding to the characteristics of its, of its student population. Um, and on the face of it, that sounds nice, right? Like if, you know, there are students who have higher needs in this school and they should get more money. Um, but it didn't really work out that way because there were all these other reforms that, um, that Bloomberg had put into place that caused the New York City school system essentially to become um, kind of like a, a, a marketplace. Um, he broke the bigger schools up into smaller little competitive units. And basically what the school started to do is to, is to compete with each other um, for, for students. Um, and, you know, when you take a step back and you kind of, ask the question, why are, why are, are schools being forced to kind of compete for students? Um, then, you know, you have to kind of wonder why don't we have, you know, why are there some schools that are great and not great rather than just have a single, you know, school system that itself is, 
is great. So this was really, I think, um, the Bloomberg administration's way of um, avoiding investing in schools that really needed support and help um, and kind of just cause the, the system itself to kind of compete um, in order for money attached to, uh, attached to particular students. And also with that reform came, um, you know, the, each school's budget was now tied to the average salary um, of, of, of its staff. Um, so basically, you know, there's ne there used to be an incentive structure in place where schools would, you know, kind of like compete for the most experienced teachers. Now it's kind of the opposite, um, where schools um, facing tight budgets um, and money mostly coming from, from student enrollment, which itself is kind of unpredictable and unstable and can be changed and influenced by external factors, right? Gentrification, climate change, things like that. Um, a pandemic, um, you know, uh, now there was this incentive, right? To kind of, if you're, if you're forced to choose which, you know, what, what to, you know, what to uh, put your money into, is it this new technology? Is it this new, you know, facilities upgrade? Or should it be, you know, uh, should we, you know, cut teachers, right? And that's and that's basically what you what you started having now is just like this push, the citywide push of veterans out of the system because they're just too expensive. So what that means is that um, a lot of schools have um, inexperienced teachers, and and inexperienced teachers start to concentrate in schools where there's very few veteran teachers to help kind of support them and, and develop them. So you get this kind of spiral, right, effect. Um, where the school system um, is, um, you know, in, in some ways, like becoming um, less prepared, right, to actually serve the students. And, and that, and that, um, and it becomes an equity issue as well, because those most experienced students tend to be in schools that are underfunded and starved and, and, and black and brown, um, because of, of the connection between race and funding. Um, so, you know, I think, one way to improve the school system uh, would be dramatically to, to kind of uh, remove the way that 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 funding has been um, been done the past um, you know decade and a half or so um, and to replace it with one that's actually equitable that you know allocates money to to schools based on their their need their actual need um, not based on you know necessarily like the character uh, the you know, competing over the right students right um, and I'll just end by saying that this kind of competitive system um, has caused uh, screening to be used as a tool, right, for schools to actually compete for, for students and hence funding. Um, during Bloomberg's administration, the number of, the percentage of screened schools um, increased from 16% to now about a third of all schools have some kind of screening. And screening is, is just basically a way for high schools and some middle schools too to pick and choose which kids um, they allow in and it's really exclusionary admissions. Um, and that itself, you know, uses admit, uh, uh, grades and attendance and, and other racialized markers. So it's also a force of, there's this kind of like economic context has really created like a, a segregationist, unleashed a segregationist um, kind of mechanism in the school system as well. And it's all connected and we have to confront it, um, you know, through and through both its economic and its rach racial impacts and see it as kind of like a single effect and problem. Yeah, the competitive nature of schools in New York definitely shocked me when I moved to New York. Um, I grew up and went to school in South Carolina, and at least in my hometown, you just went to school where you were zoned to go. Um, and I mean, there were some schools like the governor's school or something like that that was special and you could like apply for. But I remember volunteering with some high school students um, my first semester of grad school, and they were all talking about their portfolios that they were making to apply to school. And I was like, what, what are you talking about portfolios to get into high school? I was like, that sounds like they're applying to college. It was really, really bewildering to me, but this definitely provides some more background as to like why that was happening. So yeah, a lot of stress for young students. I, it was really crazy to me. Um, Jonathan, do you have anything to say on the funding or? Yeah, so, you know, the, the complicated piece is that most, the vast majority of U.S. states have undergone major financial reform between the period of 1970 to the year 2000. 
to where there is some sort of funding formula in place that either does one of a set of three things. It either places caps on how much a wealthy district can spend. It promises um, supplemental grants to try to get low, um, poor districts up to a certain threshold to be relatively comparable to the wealthier districts, or it kind of does like a combination of both, right? It, it tries to both place limits on and increase the amount of money that is going towards the low performing districts by essentially as absorbing property taxes. And then the state is involved in this kind of redistributive um, type of process. Now, what this do has done is this has given the states tremendous control over how school funding works in um, different places across the United States. The problem with this has been that we treat urban schools and uh, rural schools somewhat the same and suburban schools somewhat the same. And kind of what Ronnie is, is speaking about, we attach a dollar number to a student and we've gone engaged in this kind of um, a, a formula centered on the idea of the money follows the student. And what we are also trying to do is come up with some sort of uniform number of how much, um, how much need, how much a, a, stu a particular student's need will cost, as opposed to figuring out like the nuances of the different types of needs that students have and the different ways in which we will need to address those needs across different schooling environments, across different, even different grade levels. There's so much nuance when we talk about the different types of needs that students bring into the classroom. Because where do the needs actually come from? Well, they come from issues. It could be issues at the home. If you are, if your parents are, if your parents and your family are the victims of generations of institutional racism, what is your community going to, to look like? What are you surrounded by? What are the expectations that are placed on you? Um, you know, who, who, what is, uh, where is education and schooling in terms of all of the things that you have to confront uh, on your day to day? So how do you assess need when a kid has to figure out whether or not getting the, the has to figure out, well, what's the safest way for me to even get to school in the morning, yeah. right? Like, how do you assess need in these kinds of like, really, really like um, lived experience type of types of ways. We don't, and we don't do that. What we say is a kid is uh, a kid, it qualifies for free reduced lunch. And therefore here's an additional sort of price tag of need that we're attaching to the student. We don't get into the weeds. And I think that's why we continue to see, even as we see, even as we look at states that have done a fairly good job in terms of narrowing gaps in, in spending, just because the spending gaps themselves are narrow doesn't mean that we're doing engaging in equitable resource distribution because equity based resource distribution is to make sure that every student has the right amount of resources needed for that child to be successful. This does not mean that every kid has $8,000 or $9,000 or $22,000 per pupil. This means that every student has whatever cost, whatever amount of resources are needed so that they can get the quality education that they need to live a successful and fruitful life. But we don't do that. And that's really the next step in our, in our evolution if we're really gonna get this thing right. Yeah, yeah, lots of problems for sure. Um, so we've covered funding a good bit. So another topic um, that's related um, and also causes a lot of inequities that I wanted us to speak a bit about is um, the role of um, discipline in schools and uh, how the school to prison pipeline and the discipline gaps in different schools and different districts and between different types of students um, really affects uh, also like the achievement gap, which funding also would affect, you know, the achievement gap, but this is another big part of the picture. And uh, Johnson mentioned, um, you know, how systemic racism and institutionalized racism definitely play into funding, but they also play into these uh, issues with discipline in schools. Um, so I'm going to open it up to either you to speak on, um, you know, either policies that you think should be enacted in schools or ways uh, we could better uh, train our teachers um, to address some of these issues when they're disciplining students and or, um, you know, how can we ask our schools to uh, divest from the police and to not have police in the schools. Um, any of those topics are open. 
Sure. Um, you know, I can speak to a little bit about uh, this movement that I participated in, the Black Lives Matter um, at school um, kind of campaign, um, where every year for the past three years, we've had kind of like this week of action in February where we, um, you know, teach curriculum, we do, we protest, we have rallies. Um, one year at, at a school I taught at, we had not a walk out, but a walk in. Um, during lunch, you know, students congregated outside, protested, had signs um, demanding integration, um, chanted things like two, four, six, eight, we need to integrate. Um, you know, that, that movement I think has done a lot to also make it almost common sense this year, given the, the, the newest, um, you know, rebellion, black rebellion, that, you know, police need to be defunded. Um, and it's preposterous that, you know, the NYPD and that police like get, um, you know, spared cuts. They actually get, become militarized and get military weapons where while there are, you know, windows that can't open in school buildings, there aren't mirrors in the bathrooms in school buildings, and there are, you know, cockroaches and bed bugs crawling on desks. Um, clearly, there's a link there between what the government chooses to prioritize and what they value, and it's not education, it's, it's weapons and it's policing. Um, you see that on a societal level, you see that even within, the, within schools and the school system itself. Um, part of the education budget here in New York City goes to funding police in, 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 our, in our schools. So um, we actually like have less money than uh, earmarked for, for actual education than what you see in the, in the, in the total budget for education because a slice of that goes to, goes to police. Um, you know, we, this is also another, a testament to what the government values. We have more cops in schools uh, than uh, nurses, uh, psychologists, you know, counselors, social workers, combined, combined. Um, it's, you know, you can, you're more likely to find a cop on campus than you are a nurse, if there is any in your school. Um, something that in 2020, after a pandemic, de Blasio, uh, you know, the mayor, um, you know, promises to, to have uh, in, in, each, in each school building. And it's like, why didn't we have this already? you know, in, in, this, in this day and age. Um, so, you know, we can't connect, uh, we can't avoid connecting uh, the deficiencies in, in education funding to the surplus, to the generous amounts that police, um, in, in, in the broadest term uh, possible police get, um, especially in areas where, um, you know, there are black and brown youth, right? Like in city schools. I went to a suburban white high school. I didn't, I didn't think I ever saw a cop, um, but I see them all the time in the schools that I teach at. Um, and so I think like, you know, we need to have like actual cops removed from, from campuses. The ACLU um, has done lots of research to show that they don't help. And in fact, they're not equipped to deal with a lot of the um, just like in a societal level, right? Like, you know, they're not, they're not trained and they're not equipped to address like the actual needs of, of, of people in crisis. Um, and in fact, can cause more harm than not as we, as we seen in any, you know, and, and any activist can kind of tell you. Um, we also need to, as teachers kind of, um, you know, both fight for removing cops from school and defunding the police, but also, you know, not, Kind of stepping into that role, right? Um, unintentionally, um, we need to treat our students with with care and love and with understanding. Um, it's already hard enough to be a teenager. Um, to be a teenager who's black or brown in New York City, um, given the state of the economy and things, um, you know, we I think need to come from a from a place of of, of care, right, for our kids. So we ourselves can't you know, reproduce that behavior and become cops. We need to be trained, know how to do restorative justice, know how to de-escalate, um, know how to talk to our kids with compassion. Um, and so, you know, that I think from a policy perspective means like removing zero tolerance, right? This idea of, you know, one strike and you're out. Um, and the thing that we do is, is suspend you and deprive you of an education and shame you. You know, that's not actually a way to, um, you know, to kind of, uh, uh, address uh, a student's uh, needs, especially one who um, appears to, you know, need disciplining. Um, we 
um, need to be, I think, more understanding than that and have systems in place. Systems, by the way, that, that need money, right? To train people to, in restorative justice, you need, you need funding, right? Um, to make schools a, a better environment in which to, to learn um, and to deal with, um, you know, to deal with instances of, of um, you, know, you know, behavior that needs to be addressed. Um, we need to reduce class sizes. We need to, you know, make schools feel like an, an, a positive environment. And, you know, when there's, you know, bed bugs and, and you know, uh, paint peeling off the walls um, and there aren't any supplies to learn in um, and desks are rickety and chairs, you know, have missing legs, that doesn't inspire, um, you know, I think people to, to learn and to teach um, in, 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 the, in the most that they can. Yeah. Um, some of the things you're saying are really reminding me of um, Dr. Collins' introduction of schools being a place to really enforce a certain type of a behavior and a way of uh, enforcing a certain type of person coming out into society. And it seems like that is really a big part of um, having police in schools and these disciplines that are in schools is really to the schools and the states trying to craft a very particular type of person, I guess, coming out and not trying to, you know, work with the students and understand where they're coming from to help them become a better person or just deal with, you know, whatever they have going on in their lives. Um, so, Dr. Collins, do you have anything to say on this? Uh I, not really too much to add. I think Ronnie hit it on the head, I, when he, especially when you bring up the idea of zero tolerance. You know, it traces back to 1994, the Gun Free Schools Act of 1994. The irony of this act, of this bill, signed into law by George H.W. Bush, was that it was actually meant to, uh, to get rid of school, to get rid of guns on school campuses. And this was meant to be something that was supposed to be, at least the way it was framed, this was about preventing school mass school shootings. This is supposed to. This was something that escalated um, in a, uh, at an even higher rate after Columbine. Like this was a whole different discussion than metal detectors in high schools full of black and brown kids. But that's what it became. Mm -hmm. you know, it became well, we're going to use zero tolerance language and zero tolerance tactics um, as ways to, to to cram down on the quote unquote behavioral problems that we are assuming that these kids are endemic to having, right? So what you get is you get, you get biased teaching and yeah. that teachers are assumed are assuming that kids who look a certain way are engaging in certain behaviors based off of how they look. Ronnie also hits it on the head that there's such easy access to policing that the thin line between discipline and, and legal punitive action is blurred borderline invisible to where if you were committed, if you commit some sort of like small infraction as a kid in, in, in some of these classrooms where zero tolerance is in effect, you're standing face to face with a police officer within minutes. And then what does it mean to have police officers in schools? I went to a high school, a majority black high school. We had more police officers in our schools and we had guidance counselors. And let me tell you, it sends a message it tells you that you are here to walk a fine line and that you are here to make sure that you are essentially, uh, that you maintain a sense of order. It wasn't about aspirations. It wasn't about dreams. It wasn't about um, college access. It was, I never thought that I could even apply to a place like Brown, which is kind of the irony of working here now. And a lot of that stems from some of the uh, just some of the imagery that comes along with being in a high school where you see so many dis so many police officers and you see the actual activity of zero tolerance policies in schools taking place. So, like I said, I think Ronnie hit it right on the head, which is that, you know, the zero tolerance and the thin line that that uh, the thin line that we have between a young black boy committing a small infraction that could lead to a, an entire pathway towards the, the prison system. You know, the fact that this has been in place now, pretty much post-war, pretty much since the expansion of the, of the prison industrial complex, because of America's inability to deal with the quote-unquote excess of labor that was created after the civil rights movement. 
So all of these things are tightly connected. The prison system, the zero tolerance policies in schools, the divestment in, in urban communities, all of these things are almost one in the same. And um, you know, when we talk about disciplinary action in schools, we're talking about messages that are sent to our communities and to our societies that are simply reinforced during those eight hours when they're on a school campus. Yeah, and that's a message that's gonna stick with them throughout their life that you know they were brought up in a school system that treated them that way just based on you know where they lived or what the color of their skin was. Um, and then it, so definitely, yeah, like you're talking about for you, like it didn't really encourage you to think of applying to somewhere like Brown or, you know, moving beyond that. So it, it's really terrible um, for a lot of reasons. Um, so we have a question, interesting question um, from the audience that uh, goes along with some of these disciplinary action issues that we're talking about. So. They're asking, what are your views on disciplinary actions against students not following COVID guidelines as we're reopening schools? Um, and what, what do you think can be done or should be done to enforce some of the rules that since we unfortunately do have to open in some areas? Um, I guess, Ronnie, you're in the schools, if you wanna speak to that. Oh boy. Um, look, I, I am so worried about my safety, um, the health of both, you know, my, my coworkers and my students and their families, especially considering that I serve a population that is particularly vulnerable um, and, uh, you know, economically and politically uh, conditioned to be vulnerable um, to COVID infection and um, mortality. Um, we're also very deprived of funds and training and consideration, um, in, in my opinion, from the Department of Education. Um, there's no guarantee that we'll be provided any PPE. The reopening plan, there is none. It's a no plan. Um, and, you know, the, the more caucus that I, that I represent, the movement of rank and file educators, from, from the very get-go, we've, we've raised this Kind of concern right like if we're going to send kids back when you know in reopen schools when the number of cases is increasing still across the country um and in our opinion will increase if we op reopen the schools dramatically um you know that that means that we would have to police students right and wearing uh face masks and following uh, social distancing protocols. And that's not what we're, we're, we were trained to do, it's not what we want to do, and we're actually opposed to, to policing uh, students for all the reasons that we, that we talked about. Um, especially when structurally, like we, we are, we're already in crowded schools, right? Like this isn't a big, you know, this isn't a, a community where there was all this funding from, from you know, property and from wealthy parents to create these big open classrooms with and, and school buildings with small, you know, class sizes, you know, we're the opposite of that, right? We've been starved for funding. This, the, the Department of Education has been cramming kids every year. No, you know, without a doubt, I teach the maximum amount of kids in the classroom and that's 34. Um, sometimes I'll sneak in and it's 35 and then it's, you know, 36 people. And if there are two paraprofessionals in the room or if I have a co-teacher, that's another five people. So, you know, you can have almost 40 people in a single little tiny classroom. Um, and that's a structural problem. And I don't want to police that because it's impossible to police and it's unethical to police that, right? Um, so I think it's really on the Department of Education and as teachers, we can't lose sight of this, right? We can't be blaming students for not following, you know, protocols and, and things like that, especially when adults haven't set a great example at all, um, you know, in, 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 in the city. Um, you know, we, we, can't, we can't be in that role. We can't, I guess, fall into that trap of being police um, because it's not their kids' fault, it's not our fault, it's the DOE's fault for sending us in prematurely without resources, without um, the actual structural capacity to, to, uh, to do social distancing. Our kids are, are, are from communities that have, been, been, that have been hit so hard. Um, to think that they don't care or that they're careless, I think, you know, is, is really disingenuous. And, um, you know, I don't think we can jump to those conclusions. These kids do care about their health and they do care about us and themselves and their families. 
Um, so more often than not, they will try to follow social distancing. We have to come in with this attitude, but you know, the fact remains that we shouldn't be, re we shouldn't reopen until it's safe and it's not safe, you know, a, a week and a half out, you know, and now the DOE starts to, the Mayor de Blasio announces today that, announced today that they're now going to start, you know, doing ventilation checks in, in every school building, uh, you know, of the, you know, 1800 public schools that exist. You know, th that's not, that doesn't show consideration when you're doing that a week and a, two weeks before uh, school, the schools are supposed to open. That doesn't show that you have a plan at all. Um, and we're not going to compensate for your no plan by, by policing kids. No way. Yeah, there's, I'm sure, yeah, there's all these issues uh, with the reopening of schools and even, you know, in higher education, I know like at Columbia and at NYU, there's been these higher up plans um, from deans or whoever on how all these things are going to go really well and everything's going to be really safe. But then, yeah, the promised PPE isn't there or the checks that were going to be in place or the testing that was going to be in place doesn't happen. And so it's been really crazy uh, lately seeing these higher up people make plans and they're not actually there on the ground. They're not the ones in the labs. They're not the ones there in the classrooms and not seeing how none of their plans are working out. Um, it's very frustrating. Um, so Jonathan, you said that uh, on our planning call, you had mentioned that you were working with some survey data on COVID and reopening schools. Um, do you want to speak on that at all? Sure. I, I, think, it's, I think it's highly germane. I th so when it comes to um, just the idea of disciplinary action with kids and COVID and the return and the reopening of schools, it's about assets or kind of like an, a kind of an asset based way of thinking about kids as opposed to a deficit. Let's think about like constructive ways of, um, <clears throat> of incentivizing kids to comply. Let's make assumptions that underground underlying assumption that the kids will comply. Um, if we do it in a, in a, in a incentive based way and in a very generative and constructive way. Um, and then just have like a open and constant communication with students and with parents and, mem and family members, and just to continue to remind folks of the stakes that we're in the, that we have uh, right now, given the 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 extremity of of the of the the COVID nineteen crisis. And my survey, I'm finding that the that Black and Brown parents are significantly more opposed to schools reopening um, than white parents. I'm finding, but they're also the ones who are more willing to take on the safety precautions. So it's it's the it's the parents of color that are willing to that are, are very supportive of mandatory testing and frequent testing. They're supportive of um, social distancing amongst kids, keeping them six feet apart at all times. They're supportive of um, making sure that all kids wear masks at all times. So just the in, just in terms of just like public opinion and political support, it's there. It's something that's valued. So you don't have to um, you don't have to discipline kids into compliance. I think the understanding is already there in these communities. It's just a matter of coming about coming at this idea in a way of, again, thinking about kids and their compliance with public public safety recommendations and precautions as an asset. This is a way that you are contributing to the greater good of the school, the greater good of the society. You are making the world a better place by doing these kinds of things. Our kids get that. Our kids understand that. Their evidence suggests that their parents do. And this means that this is the kind of conversation that is happening in the household. Should we reopen? No, because these parents are also strongly, again, strongly opposed to reopening. The thing that complicates it is that while they're also strongly opposed to reopening, they're also the most likely to, to, to say that they have issues accessing a computer or laptop for their kid. They're also the ones who are more likely to say that they expect learning losses to impact a kid, a kid who looks like them the most. So the stakes they perceive, and, the, and rightfully so, are higher for these parents. So if we're going to do remote, we need to do it. We need to do remote in a way that we provide additional resources and care for these parents and their and their kids. And when we do reopen, we need to trust that they are just as invested, if not more invested, in making sure that we have safe, uh, and safe and 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 and, and, con and constructive and generative and uh, and really model schools they can really show the rest of the country, this is how we move through a pandemic. Um, so it, it's all about trust communication and thinking about kids as assets. Yeah. yeah. 
It's a great way to look at it. Um, so uh, just a reminder to the audience, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A because uh, we're going to be wrapping things up in 10 or 15 minutes. Um, but a question I have for both of you is we've talked a lot about all the different issues um, in education that are really important to pay attention to, to be an activist, to fight against, and to go to the polls um, this fall and vote to hopefully have some change um, in the near future. Um, but as for you guys as teachers, um, I wanted to ask a question about, um, you know, what are some things that you wish were taught more in schools or what are things that you tried to uh, teach in your classrooms that um, you think is really important for students to learn that's not like a traditional thing that's taught in the classroom and um, how do you, you know, what is a way to, um, I guess, encourage other teachers or other um, educators uh, to do that as well? Oh, that's a good question. Um, something that I teach that's a little unorthodox that I think other educators should should teach. I mean, I, ooh, um, so I'm a biology teacher and, you know, even in some ways just, just existing as a biology teacher itself is, you know, a little controversial, right? Uh, more so in, in other parts of the country, but you know, but still, um, I think, you know, something that I would encourage all biology or science teachers to, um, you know, kind of focus on is climate change. Um, climate change is, you know, I think the single most important, you know, kind of issue and crisis that we're, that we're going through. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. It, it's, and the main one being that I don't see it as a separate kind of phenomenon. It's, it, it, it'll, you know, it exacerbates, um, you know, oppression, it enhances inequalities. Um, you know, we're going through, through a pandemic, climate change will expand the zone in which infectious disease would, um, would spread. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that I would uh, very much support it being mandated um, to teach. And there's, there's a bill, I think, in, in Albany right now that was introduced by, yeah, Senator um, Gennard mandating climate change. Um, but even then, I, I think I, I teach it in a way that might be a little bit different from, from other educators in that, um, you know, we need to, I think, go beyond this, this idea that climate change um, can be, you know, if we accept it, right, as a phenomenon that is occurring, which we should, um, by, you know, looking at the evidence and, and using the evidence to arrive at, at the conclusions that the majority, super majority of scientists have, have reached, um, you know, we should be thinking about you know, who's responsible, you know, or, or what systems and what mechanisms in place that are responsible. And I think, you know, reading um, authors like Naomi Klein, you know, and bringing her into, you know, uh, into conversation, um, you know, I think we start to see that it's, you know, the majority of pollution is caused by not, not individuals, you know, forgetting to flip their, their light switches off, but, you know, industries that um, are motivated by, by profit um, to, you know, to um, accumulate as much capital as possible without really regard to, to the environmental uh, consequences, um, right, which, which um, if they did would be would cut into their profits. Um, and I think I, I kind of add that perspective into the classroom in a way that, um, you know, doesn't impose anything on the kids, but, you know, offers kind of like another perspective um, that they maybe, you know, don't consider because it isn't one that um, there's really like an incentive structure in place in the mainstream, you know, um, kind of culture and media to, to consider. So um, I think in any way possible, you don't have to be a science educator. Um, you know, you can be a history, English teacher, you know, whatever it is, try to bring some aspect of climate change into your classroom. Because um, it is it is like the, the issue that I think just connects kind of everyone's um, you know, concerns and oppressions and, and worries. Um, and it's also a conversation though, that's really hard to have. So as much as we can, um, you know, have that in the classroom and give inspiration and hope to our kids, um, the better. It's actually our responsibility to teach climate change in a way that's both evidence-based, but also solution oriented. Um, and you're not gonna, I think as a, as a, as a 
you know, as a kid, look at this, you know, apocalyptic, you know, crisis and, you know, have like the natural reaction that this is, that, you know, this will be all right. You know, it's, it's overwhelming and it's scary. Um, but if we can have those conversations and bring perspectives that are solution oriented with the kids and have that discussion collectively, then I think, you know, that'll inspire hope, you know, hope that um, I think will translate into action um, cause you know, we need as many hands on deck as possible to, to push back against the interests who profit from climate change cause they exist. Um, and, you know, steer as much as we can off that, off that path so that we have a chance cause we deserve it. Our kids deserve it. We deserve a chance to, to live, um, on this planet, on a planet that's habitable, you know, um, in a way that's as equitable, um, as, as, as we deserve. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, Jonathan, do you have something to add? Yeah, and well, so <laughs> we teach at different levels. So um, I guess my advice would be I mean, a, a little different. When I'm thinking about like teaching, te teaching students, college students who are looking to become teachers, like I teach kids who I hope will be like Ronnie, you know, uh, and take on that role and do that kind of work. Um, the main things I always emphasize um, that I, the one thing I emphasize that I think is particularly uh, germane to March for Science is that, you know, the scientific method isn't just for the hard sciences, you know, yeah, that yeah. we should engage in this kind of like scientific process when just identifying and trying to solve pro problems, whether it's a policy related problem, whether it's about a reform, whether it's a, about finding different ways for um, classroom instruction and practice to take place. Right. The scientific method is could be very much applicable and it should be very much applicable for what we do in social sciences and what folks do as practitioners in the classroom. The other thing uh, that, you know, um, experience is something that enhances the educational experience, not something that detracts it. So, you know, you, you get I get students who come from various backgrounds and I think that they're so used to their their background not being valued that they think to put their experience into the classroom this becomes some, some sort of a liability or puts them at some, some sort of a deficit. What I try to do is emphasize it like, no, your experience is the thing that actually enhances the experience, the learning experience. We learn more when people are sharing their experiences, when people are sharing different ideas that can, that can essentially be, that they can arise from the, the types of lives that we live. And then the last thing is that kind of related to that, that learning is a collective experience. It's not a competitive experience. I always tell my students, there's no monopoly on A's. You know, anybody, everyone in the class can get an A. Um, my paycheck is still the same whether everyone gets A's or not, right? The most important thing is that like, can we have a collective learning experience where we're not competing? Where we understand that like, we're actually only as strong as the quote unquote weakest student in the classroom. When we're all learning and engaging together, to me, that's when I've always had the most fun in the classroom, when I personally have learned the most, and I feel like I've seen the most growth, the most growth amongst my students. So, you know, those are the kinds of kind of principles that I, I try to emphasize in the classroom and hopefully extend to some of my students who go on to become teachers in K through 12. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I have thought about being a teacher some myself, and that's definitely um, one thing I learned um, in a class a year or two ago was to really try to emphasize in teaching that it's not competitive, but it should be everybody trying to help each other, build each other up, which I think happens a good bit, um, like in elementary or grade schools, but then definitely once you get high school, college, it becomes very competitive. Um, and it's not the best way for everybody to learn. Um, okay, we have a few questions in the Q&A. Um, so, we're about to finish up. We're getting close to seven, but I'll ask um, one of the questions at least. Um, so we have a question asking, um, can you speak more on the importance of incentive-based systems versus disciplinary systems with respect to resource allocation in schools? Can you uh, rephrase the, the question? Um, I guess, yeah, I guess they're asking, um, 
you know, how are resources allocated in schools and how do um, incentive based systems versus disciplinary systems play into how are schools funded? So I think this is a question that raises that raises what I feel feel is was the central critique of the No Child Left Behind Act, mm -hmm. which was that well now we're in a scenario where we have to collect all of this additional data on on schools and student performance. But we're collecting this data for the purposes of identifying the, the schools that would be met with punitive action for not meeting standards, as opposed to figuring out different incentives for schools who may struggle to meet quote unquote standards or are essentially the at the mercy of the bias that may be factored in, that may be underneath the construction of the standards to begin with. Um, I think that's my, kind of my read on the question. And, you know, you know, and then Ronnie, I don't know if you, you have um, more to speak to it more to say about it. I think the only thing I would say is that we just need a more nuanced approach in terms of developing standards to begin with. Right? It, it shouldn't just be kind of uniform. This is what a, 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 an eighth grade reader looks like. This is what a, a third grade math student who's proficient looks like. We should have just kind of like a little bit more nuanced understanding, different expectations. Why do we assume the kids should be automatically at a certain level by a certain age? I just think that in itself is, um, you know, is not the most logical way to approach expectations for students in, in, in academic achievement. Um, I, I, again, I think the incentive thing just kind of gets students to think more about development and growth as opposed to thinking about, well, will my school be closed if we don't do, if we don't do well on this test? Or, you know, will my teacher be gone if we don't do well on this test? Or, um, you know, some more sort of punitive result. Yeah, I mean, the education system, especially in the cities, is punitive through and through. Um, you know, administrations are punished, teachers are punished, students are punished, um, school systems are punished um, if they don't, um, you know, follow the, you know, or adhere to the newest, um, you know, probably gimmick that was funded by, you know, someone who had never been by private philanthrop philanthropic money of people who've never been inside of a, of a, of a public school building. Um, you know, you think about the teacher evaluation system it is extremely punitive, um, you know, tying test scores to, to students and using, you know, that, that kind of metric as, as if, um, you know, the, as if a, a, a teacher working in a, in a classroom that doesn't even have updated textbooks or any textbooks really and rickety desks is, um, you know, is going to be the sole cause for, for a student's, um, you know, low grades, a student that, you know, is, has a one out of 10 chance of being homeless um, in New York City. Um, you know, it's it, all the, all the ills of society have been, you know, they kind of, they, they appear, right. And they, and they, and they bleed through in, in, in the schools and, you know, they're used to, to punish everyone who's, in, who's in the school system. Um, and, you know, that kind of punishment, like your school gets closed, um, you know, your, your, your veteran teachers get pushed out because they're too expensive, because now budgets are tied to their salaries. Um, you know, that, that punishment really just creates kind of more opportunities for, um, you know, education, business industries and, and things like that to kind of get a foot in the door and to, you know, privatize and to shape education in their own image. And, and this is going back to what Dr. Collins was, Dr. Collins was saying before, um, you know, as, as really, you know, um, we've made a lot of progress as, a, as like a, a civil rights movement in making education in some ways, like, you know, um, you know, not making it completely in the image of, of the rich and of the bosses who, you know, are looking for a, for a workforce that has like the basic minimum um, in order to make them money, um, you know, but those interests are still there and they're trying, you know, they're trying to get rid of, to try to clear out of the way the teachers unions and the parent and student group and activists um, and, and the protections that we have um, in order for them to shape education 100% in their own image. Um, and we can't let that happen. You know, we want, we want education to remain something that, um, or even want to make it more so of, a, of, a, of an opportunity for kids to, um, and for, for teachers to experiment, to, um, you know, to 
grapple with social issues and questions and, and things like that. It's not just about, it's not just vocational training, um, although that's important, um, but it's, it's much more than that. And we can't let interest get, get in the way by creating like systems for, for, for punishing and, and, and systems for rewarding schools that, you know, exclude the wrong kids, which I mentioned earlier, Bloomberg was able to, to kind of do, punish you because you're of the wrong race or because you're, you know, we're born and live in the wrong zip code of the city in the wrong borough. Um, you know, we have to remove all those, you know, what I think are punitive punishing systems um, in order to make the system actually equitable. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, it definitely feels like the education system is kind of like a factory that's just trying to turn out a certain type of student, a certain type of person to, yeah, just fill labor positions in society or uh, act a certain way, be a certain way. Um, and it's not very holistic. Um, so um, I think that's all the time we have for today. Um, thank you both so very much uh, for being here today and for sharing your expertise and your insight um, into both higher education and grade school and activism and all uh, parts of our education system. Um, I definitely learned a lot from both of you and I hope everybody else did too. Um, so this is the last um, panel in our pant summer for science policy panel series. Um, and what we were really hoping to do here was to educate everyone on the top eight issues um, coming into the very important election coming up this fall. So we hope you learned a lot um, with us and that you can take away these lessons and feel like a more educated and prepared voter um, coming into the uh, polls this fall and uh, make a good choice uh, when you're voting. So thank you both again. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, and good night. <laughs>